Andreas, thank you. We will start with the shipping center role in the economic development. And you should know very well that shipping has about 5,000 year documented history. Uh, but during the last two centuries, actually, sea transport has, has acquired a special place through its central role in the glo globalization of the world economy. When steamships able to burn uh, fossil fuels arrived in the early 19th century, the result was stunning. Since the 1840s, the volume, and that's based on Clarkson statistics, the volume of cargo moved by sea has increased by a factor of 400. That is to say, we transport 400 times as much cargo today as we did then. Today, we transport about 8 million tons of cargo each year. Uh, nearly up 2 billion are for energy and the rest for dry cargo. Uh, distance and quantity definitely is not a problem. And maritime nations import billions of tons of energy, commodities like oil, coal, and gas. Millions of tons of agricultural products and also uh, 1 billion tons of raw materials and products uh, for the metals industry. So that gives you an idea of the quantities that we carry as maritime industry. Finally, there is a billion of tons of manufacturers, semi-manufacturers, including the machinery, spare parts, and consumer society need to keep the wheels of modern society running. Historically, we have to say that the development of the technology to burn fossil fuels was slow, tedious, and littered with commercial disasters. It, in fact, it took um, well over a century for steamships to drive sailing ships from the sea. The pace was slow because the early steam engines were far too large to fit themselves into those kind of boats. It was not until the end of the 18th century, and do apologize for this part of the lecture, I have to refer to my notes, because this is historic before my time. So, <laughs> until the 18th century, the boiler technology had improved enough for engineers to experiment with steamboats burning coal, and probably the first uh, was the Charlotte Dundas, which in March 1803 pulled two barges against the wind along the canal in Scotland. Now, as steam engines became more efficient and shipbuilders gained knowledge how to exploit their potentials, they helped to create a whole new world. The steamships were from iron or steel hulls, which started to appear after 1840 and were initially not different in size and speed from the sailing ships they replaced. If you have similarities of this history from somewhere else, don't worry, history has been written once, so we have to repeat it the same way. The difference then was that the potential was greater than many people thought of the time. And at the 18th century it was progressing, they became bigger, faster, and massively more efficient at moving cargo. The ability to sail on the tight schedule and to maintain cost of speed gave them uh, the name of an indigenous uh, or a genuine uh, uh, revolution of the time. The fastest ships in the, in, 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 in the fleet were about running from seven knots in 1833, statistically, to 23 knots in 1914. Efficiency also improved thanks to automation of fossil fuels. Finally, steam technology picked out in the 40s, 1940s of course now, and, uh, and its place was taken by diesel engines using oil, booming of the global economy during the 60s of course, and 60s also allowed the exploitation of the potential of the diesel engine and new shipbuilding techniques which have been developed during the Second World War. The decade that followed is characterized by innovation in which passenger liners transform into cruise liners. I'm sure my family knows that part very well. Uh, were successfully developed including vehicles, carriers, forest products, etc., etc., etc. Ships today have gone from simple designs to complex and innovative designs that require specialized crew and running, uh, running processes demanding a continuous update of knowledge of those on board to keep in line 
with new developments in engineering, steamship and communications with show offices. Further, and that's important to know, ships have the nationality of one country, they are manned by nationals of another country, and they are actually owned by nationals of a third country, making the industry truly international and global. And on that point, I believe the best way to see that is to watch a video by the International Chamber of Shipping explaining to us how important and how global this industry is. The international shipping industry carries 90% of world trade. It is the lifeblood of the global economy. There are around 50,000 merchant ships trading internationally, transporting every kind of cargo. Without shipping, intercontinental trade, the bulk transport of raw materials, and the import and export of affordable food and manufactured goods would simply not be possible. Half the world would starve, and the other half would freeze. Ships are technically sophisticated, high-value assets that can cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build. Their safe operation and reliability are crucial to the continuing health of the world economy. And as world trade grows, the international shipping industry has responded to the demand for its services. United Nations estimates show annual freight rates of more than $400 billion, which represents approximately 5% of the total global economy. It is the availability, low cost and efficiency of maritime transport that has in large part been responsible for recent dramatic improvements in global living standards. The shipping industry today is truly international, flying the flags of over 150 different nations and manned by over a million seafarers of most nationalities. It is also one of the safest, cleanest and most efficiently run industries. So how has this been achieved? It's all thanks to a global framework of regulations which govern safety and the prevention of pollution. It's vital that construction standards, navigational rules and crew qualifications are consistent among all ships in international trade. When a ship sails from Brisbane to Buenos Aires, the same rules need to apply at both ends of the voyage. The alternative would be a web of conflicting national regulations, and that would be disastrous for both safety and the efficiency of world trade. Fortunately, shipping is highly regulated at the global level by the United Nations, in particular by the London-based International Maritime Organization, or IMO. The level of ratification and enforcement of IMO conventions around the world is very high. For instance, the Safety of Life at Sea Convention, or SOLAS, and the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution by Ships, known as MARPOL, have been implemented by virtually every maritime country. But nations also have the power to detain foreign ships in port if they do not comply with the regulations, a serious sanction port states are not afraid to use. As a result, although the nature of the sea means that ships are exposed to considerable physical risk, the safety record of the shipping industry and its environmental performance are impressive. Serious maritime accidents have more than halved in the last 10 years at the same time as the amount of maritime trade has almost doubled. The quantity of oil spilled is now running at less than 10% of the level in the early 90s. And carbon dioxide emissions from cargo ships are a fraction of the equivalent figure for aircraft. There is a wide variety of merchant ships trading internationally and they fall into a number of categories. Container ships carry most of the world's manufactured goods and products, usually on scheduled liner services. The latest generation of container ships can each carry as much as 10,000 heavy trucks. 
Bulk carriers, the workhorses of the fleet, transport raw materials such as iron ore, coal and foodstuffs. The largest bulk carriers can carry up to 200,000 tonnes of grain. That's enough to feed half a million people for a year. Tankers transport crude oil, chemicals and petroleum products. The largest can carry over 300,000 tonnes of oil, enough to heat an entire city for a year. Other types of ship include car carriers, gas carriers, heavy lift vessels and ships supporting the offshore oil industry. There are also a large number of smaller general cargo ships. Ferries usually carry a mix of passengers, cars and commercial vehicles over shorter distances and the number of luxury cruise ships has also grown greatly in recent years. Continuous improvements in technology and efficiency have made the costs of moving goods by sea very competitive. Over the last 50 years, US retail prices have risen by almost 700%. During the same period, bulk shipping costs have increased by just 70%. That's why the typical cost at the pump to a consumer in the United States of transporting crude oil from the Middle East is only about half a cent per litre. And the cost of transporting a tonne of iron ore from Australia to Europe is only about $10 while shipping a can of beer costs about one cent. But over two-thirds of world shipping tonnage is associated with the energy and metal industries. The health of the shipping industry is heavily dependent on them. Moreover, shipping markets are cyclical and notoriously volatile, and one of the main tasks of ship owners is to manage these huge financial risks. As we've seen, shipping is amongst the safest and most environmentally friendly forms of commercial transport. It was amongst the very first industries to adopt international safety standards, which have been widely implemented through the International Maritime Organization. In recent years, the world has seen a major shift towards industrial production in Asia. This has in turn brought about a significant improvement in global standards of living. It is only the international shipping industry and the low cost and the efficiency of moving goods by sea that has made this possible. Shipping is indeed the lifeblood of the global economy. This thing you just saw, which is, it told you that half of the population of Earth will starve and the other half will freeze if we do not move these goods around. And I'm telling you another important point. If shipping doesn't move, Cyprus will not only freeze, it will starve as well. It's an isolated island with no products. Specifically, marine engineering for me, and I believe it should be for the whole industry, is the discipline of applying engineering science mostly mechanical and electrical engineering, to the development, design, operation, and maintenance of watercrafts, propulsion, and onboard systems. Why do I stress that? Because if we do not appreciate what marine engineering means, these ships will not sail. These ships will probably will not be built, or these ships will most probably will have no propulsion power. Half a century from their introduction, ships engineers will be licensed in the same way that shipmates and masters have done the decade before. In 1889, the formal recognition came for these people, and by the end of the 19th century, marine engineers would be emerging as another of the subgroups of increasing engineering specialization identified in the, information, in the formation of professional institutions. And listen now, the civil engineers, 1818, the mechanical engineers in 1845, the naval architects in 1860 and us in 1889. By 1900, it's true that the engine room departments of engineers, firemen, and trimmers and ordinary machine ships match the numbers, the deck departments of master, mates, and seamen on a powerful line as greatly exceeded them. 
Today, marine engineers form an integral part of shipping, either, either on board the vessels or on shore. And that's why today, universities and polytechnics institutions offer the holders of an extra first class uh, certificate of competency to study for a Bachelor of Science and a Master's in Science for marine engineering or for a degree into the marine uh, field related subject and to status of charter engineering. The global nature though of the industry demands highly specialized engineering either for manning the ships or for shore control, including innovation in design for increased productivity and efficiency. And these words are very important today, especially the last part, efficiency. Let's alone that the high safety standards and environmental standards required to maintain at all times in order to protect the environment that we are sailing in, the marine environment. The next element that we cannot live without is marine technology. In addition to the engineers, the industry requires marine technology. I put here what the 40 Euro European universities call what is marine technology, and in essence is uh, technologies for the safe exploitation, production of an intervention of the marine environment. It could include naval architecture, marine engineering, ship design, ship building and ship operations, oil and gas exploration and exploitation and also production, hydrodynamics, navigation and so on. Marine technologies are characterized by their ability to act as exponents of today's technology through creativity and innovation. Uh, to this end, they maintain and manage applications of current and developing technology and may undertake technological design, development, manufacture, construction, operation. All these things are not mine. These are common knowledge and you'll find them on the webpage of the IMRS as well. Marine engineers and marine technologists, they can make the industry move, they can make the industry exist and they can make the industry continuously work without interruption. But, we like it or not, now we come to the subject I know very well. We need the marine science. As I already said, the first two disciplines can really make shipping work. But its huge expansion did not come without side effects. And I insist on side effects. Initial ships were carrying ballast water by carrying stones from one part of the world to another part of the world. Then we invented with the naval architects, we found that it was much easier, much easier to carry ballast water. But ballast water does not come free. It contains invasive species. What that means, you carry pathogens, animals in simple terms, from one place to another, but in the place they find themselves new is not their habitat, and they invade the space and they create problems. One major problem, they deplete, deplete stocks of fishery. Number two, they're overtaking the area, and number three, find their way to rivers and oysters. On top of that, we had other problems. For many years, we were using tripolitin as the pain on the hulls for the hulls not to foul, We is known to you as TBT. That was actually one of the most dangerous things that we were doing, especially in high concentration areas like outside shipyards. Marine life lost its sexuality. Males were becoming female and females were becoming male or non-sexual, so many species were disappearing. On top of that, it found its way to the, to the food chain, and by finding that to the food chain, it caused problems to the human health. On top of that, we have side effects of fossil fuels. Um, the, the side effects of fossil fuel consumption by ships are no longer acceptable by local communities who are becoming concerned about the health risk of pollution caused by measure ships in their coastal waters and ports. It's not by mistake or by accident that the port of California has this high strict uh, demands for ships entering or leaving that port. And it's not by mistake that the Baltic has extremely uh, high level of, 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 uh, of demands when it comes to ships emissions like NOxs, the nitrogen oxides, or the sulfur oxides, because those they cause one, acid rain, and number two, cause cancer. Marine scientists are involved in research, analysis, and focused in relation to the oceans and their forms in the coastal areas. 
They, they analyze the sea and its interaction with the land, atmosphere, sea floors, and the use of information came to perfect changes to the infrastructure. Now, that kind of thing is not allowed anymore. If you, if you go to the Baltic in, in few, um, let's say two years from now, you will not be able to bear anything apart from distillates. And the distillates are becoming part of the norm now. You will bear distillates by 2020, by 2015 or by 2025, but definitely not after that. So we have to accept our industry has side effects that the society cannot tolerate anymore. And on top of that, oh, sorry, before going to the climate change, we can say that the work of the, of the technologists and the engineers, but also of the scientists, brought us new technologies. Water ballast management systems, things that we didn't have a clue about a few years ago. And guess what on this situation? The dreamers of the, of the regulators, they had no clue about the technology, but they invented the regulation. In 2004, they imposed on an industry a regulation of a biological standard that no industry had already produced an equipment to achieve it. The scientists, the engineers, and the technologists got together, and they produced those kind of things you see on the back, are called scrappers, are top ballast water management systems. What that tell us, we will see further down the lecture why we need more the scientists as we get into the 2020s and most probably will go closer to 2050, which is the big goal of 50-50-50. And on top of that, ladies and gentlemen, there is a new problem arising where the scientists are fundamentally important, is the climate change. It is true that shipping is efficient. It is true that shipping does not create as much problem on carbon dioxide emissions as other transport industries. The thing is, we do have to reduce the footprint. And how we do that, we need science. Why is it not acceptable anymore for us to emit carbon dioxide? I don't know, it's political, it's national. At the end of the day, the scientists put the case in place, we accepted that. From 2013, January this year, we are not building any more ships which are not supposed to conform to efficiency standards. You most probably heard of a work called EEDI, that's the Energy Efficiency Design Index, developed by IMO, and it is in force. Unfortunately, that's not the end. Existing fleet is under scrutiny. An existing fleet is under scrutiny by two major points, the international community or the European community. We don't know which one of all will succeed, but I hope so that it will be the international. And here I come to the perfect mix. And here it's very important to see the economics, how they interfere to the whole subject. The shipping trade is managed through a market-driven system which ruthlessly drives down transport cost. Can you imagine that one liter of petrol from Saudi Arabia to the United States costs 50, half a cent for the American population? Okay, it might not be for the European population, but why is that possible? It's because we have an industry that runs without barriers, or very few barriers, which means one of the few examples of the classical economist perfect competition model at work. This market-based uh, system combined with improved engineering, improved science, and improved technology means that the transport cost for key commodities such as coal and oil hardly increases. But the reason this happens is because you have this perfect economic model supplemented by science, supplemented by technology and engineering. The three of the multidisciplinary mix are actually the ones driving this low-cost global industry. In essence, the mix has turned the shipping industry to a reliable, efficient transport mode that has helped turn the world into a single marketplace, something that the European Union and their economic market is actually trying to establish for the last 
40 years, I would say, and they're still looking into it. We have created that one through our industry. It does not matter where a company is domiciled to produce its products or raw materials because they can be supplied in the market for just a few dollars. They might be domiciled in Germany, producing the Mercedes in, in, in China, bring them back to Europe, and it's still low cost, and it is a low cost um, um, uh, product for us, the Europeans. Billios have benefited from the massive productivity improvements achieved by the bulk, specialized in container shipping, especially the last 60 years. But Billios are expected to benefit in the future if the trade growth trend of the 150 years continues by 2050, the 8 billion tons of cargo will have grown to actually 23 billion tons. Unfortunately, further expansion, and that's very important, means high rise of the industry's carbon footprint. The basic energy systems on which the motor shipping industry relies on the cost of fossil fuels, upon which the sea transport revolution was built, and that's why we have to look for alternative fuels. And on the, on the other hand, this fuel, which is, is becoming scarce, its price escalates from $10 a barrel. Now we reach, we reach beyond 100 and we are stabilizing on $100 per barrel. And as I explained, and as you have already seen in the movie by ICS, the work cannot leave without shipping. But Chippe cannot live without the perfect mix of marine engineering, science, and technology. But both, and this is the message I'm planning to pass through this lecture to the institution, both the industry and the mix must adapt to the new requirements of the society. The society does not react anymore. It doesn't expect a new heaven. It doesn't expect a new Exxon Valdez to react and create a new convention. The society today demands proactivity. It defines the regulation not even on a prospective way, but on a way that is goal-based. And it needs you to go out and do the job for them and produce it on a time that your VCH is appropriate. And it's not a joke. We have three international instruments they have demanded, and I don't see the appetite of the society changing. The society today demands the engineers, the scientists, and the technologists to be proactive and deliver the goods on time. On a time, most probably, we might not be able to deliver, but that's when they want them. Now, if we do not ad adapt, what are the problems? If we do not adapt, then the shipping industry will not adapting and therefore will not conform to the needs of the society. And if it doesn't conform to the needs of the society, it will become expensive. And if it becomes expensive, it will not be any more competitive to the other transport modes. And why should we remain the number one industry in the world? We will just pass it to rail, we just pass it to aviation, and God knows maybe Zeppelins, I don't know. Something that will do the transport in a different way. We do here in the IMRS, we have an obligation to pass the message to the engineers, to the scientists, and to the technologists that we do bring this industry around and the industry cannot live without us. Our job is not anymore a simple job of a seafarer or a simple scientist in a lab. It's much more global. It's a much more demanding by the society and it will actually give us the unique essence who we are because from all the institutions of our discipline, we are the only ones that we have the mix. The other ones are actually concentrating on one. Maybe the naval architects, maybe the engineers. SNAM is the closest to us, the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers in the United States, but still missing the third link, which in my opinion, in the near future, will hold the key for the shipping regulations to come. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know that half of your engineers, half of you might be technologists, but the other half in this room, I know they might be diplomats and they might be 
housewives or, 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 or another kind of engineer, and not all of us, we do actually know or understand how shipping is important to our daily life. And I'm very glad that the IMO last year produced this question. Do we realize the importance of shipping? Chaque jour, des navires transportent jusqu'à nous la majorité des produits que nous utilisons ici. Every single thing, most probably, we have in our house arrived by ship. It is finally, as far as I'm concerned, important for us to have here at the MRS to promote rigorously the importance of shipping and its dependency on the mix. It's very important that the mix plays a major role to this. If we don't have the mix, we don't have shipping. If we have shipping without the mix, I don't know what it is. So we actually achieve sustainable maritime transport, which we can pass it to the generations to come. And sustainable, you all ver know very well, I present the case a few months ago, a month ago at the IMO on the Sustainable Maritime Transport Conference, and it is a big word. Everybody has its own understanding. But what it means at the end of the day, sustainable, is that we deliver something we are having today, the same thing to the new generations, without actually spoiling their life or depleting all their resources. If we see that way, what we're actually trying to do, let's make this sustainable, let's continue to be the number one industry in the world. But this mix, which I think I made my case today, it's the most important element for shipping to remain as is. There's another element which is not only important, it is the heart of a ship. But they are not an engineers. They are not scientists and not technologists. They're actually the simple seafarers. And the simple seafarers, they deserve a special uh, remembrance and a special mentioning. That's why the IMO established their own day. Therefore, I would like to close this lecture by showing you the thank you that I would like to pass to these seafarers.
Zia's lecture was about showing you and passing you the message how we, in a different place of the globe, we are looking into shipping. I'm coming from a country where shipping is the second biggest driver of the economy and actually gives 7% to the GDP, and it has a mix. It doesn't have a solid industry on engineering. It doesn't have a solid industry on sailing. It has an industry which we call it a cluster. And since you made the honor to elect me as your president outside the United Kingdom, I thought that this year's lecture would be more beneficial to include something from us that we became part of your family here in the Institute of the Amarest. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.